But way back when I was in seminary, I worked in uh, at a Presbyterian church in the northern part of Pasadena, California. Uh, Westminster Presbyterian had at one time been a huge church and an affluent white community. It had 2,500 members, had a sanctuary that seated literally 1,100. In the 60s and the 70s, uh, the racial makeup of the community began to change radically. African Americans and Hispanics moved into the area as many whites fled forced busing in Pasadena schools. So by the early 1980s, when I was there, church membership was down to about 250. And on Sunday morning, you had a little more than 100 people in worship. But the church was committed to ministering to their changing community. And as a part of the youth program I was working in, we tried to reach out to mostly Black and Hispanic kids in our community. Now, to be honest, on the church side, we were all white and educated and very middle class and felt a great burden to be understanding and gracious to a group of people who had been historically demeaned and oppressed by mainstream Anglo culture, even if we frankly didn't know the first thing about working with them. So we were very giving and very understanding and cut the kids a lot of slack in different ways. And while there were a few success stories from those days, it's fair to say that there were far more failures and problems. There were a lot of times when we were taken advantage of, lied to, stolen from, manipulated, the only non-Anglo person on staff at the church was John House. John was a tall, powerful, yet very small-spoken African-American who took tireless care of that church facility like it was a shrine. We never knew much about his history, but it was obvious that John was very streetwise, and he knew the ways of these neighborhood kids far better than we did. One day in a staff meeting, we were talking about uh, something that we had done for some kid and had been totally misused by them common topic. And John uncharacteristically interrupted our conversation and he said this. He says, you guys don't understand these kids. They take kindness for weakness. When you cut them some slack, they just think you're weak. And because of that, they can take advantage of you. And then he said it again. They take kindness for weakness. Now, I think John was probably right. I think most of these kids saw our efforts to be kind to them as a sign that we could be manipulated or ignored or easily conned. Frankly, that was the culture that they had grown up in and fallen into. But how should that have affected the way we acted towards them? Should we have toughened up, offered back to them a stern exterior to prevent them from walking all over us? Or was that the wrong approach for people who hoped to show someone the love of Jesus Christ? You know, it wasn't an easy answer then or now. As we continue our study on nine elements of character, that the Apostle Paul called the fruit of the Spirit of Galatians. Uh, we're up to kindness today. But the fruit of the Spirit uh, is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now, the word uh, that we commonly translate kindness in Galatians is krestotis. It's from the adjective krestos. Um, and I think a good way to define kindness um, is, uh, is giving a grace that is undeserved or unexpected. Now, for you budding Greek scholars out there, you'll note that this word sounds a lot like the Greek word for Messiah, Christos. It's not related to that word. So I just want to point that out. The word is not always translated kind or kindness either. You know, it's actually, it's interesting how this word can be used in a variety of ways. In fact, there's a scripture I bet many of you know that uses this word, but I'll, I'll, I'll guess you have no idea that it does. It's Matthew 11, 28. Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You all know that verse, right? But it ends, for my yoke is crestos, easy, and my burden is light. And I have to admit, I kind of like the idea you know, for my yoke is kind. That's what Jesus tells us about his guiding of us. Another interesting way this word is used actually is described wine. Luke 5, 39, Jesus says, no one after drinking old wine wants the new one, for he says the old is better, crestos. Same word there. You know, the, the wine has aged and mellowed, and it's easier to drink. It's, it's kinder to drink. And sometimes the same word for kindness as translated uh, as good or goodness. Uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 15.33, do not be said, 
Bad company corrupts Christos, character, kind to character, good character. Or First Peter, like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is Christos, good or more accurately kind. And Christotes or Christos appears only a few more times in the New Testament. Now, I had to say it has to be said that kindness is one of those virtues that, that not many people disagree with. Uh, most of the ancient philosophers talked about the importance of being kind to your fellow humans. And, and while you might think uh, that a man might be a little bit wimpy if he talked about the importance of being kind, uh, Marcus Aurelius, the Roman emperor from 61 to 180 AD, wrote a book while he was leading the Roman legions in war against the Germanic tribes in the north. And in that book, even he wrote about kindness. He said, consider that a kind disposition is invincible if it is genuine. And it's not affected, not an affected smile or an acting part. This is the way to disarm the most outrageous person, to continue kind and unmoved under ill usage and to strike in at the right opportunity with advice but let all be done out of mere love and kindness. A truly kind man never talks of a good turn he has done, but does another as soon as he can, just like a vine that bears again the next season. In fact, some early Christians thought Marcus Aurelius might have been a Christian. He was not. In fact, he was quite, um, quite opposed to Christianity. Certainly, simply promoting kindness in your character is one of the few things that's not going to set you as a Christian apart necessarily from our culture. I'm sure you've seen that bumper sticker that began to, to appear a few years ago. You know, practice random uh, acts of kindness. And some people have really taken this to heart, buying coffee for the person behind them in the drive through It's, you know, pay it forward is what we're calling it now, but it really stems from the same random acts of kindness idea. And, and well, I will tell you that a lot of the time I'm up here in the pulpit warning you about the way our culture differs values, differ from our Christian values. You know, it's nice to see that the common grace that God gives all of our broken humanity still allows for some of God's graces to break through, allows us to embrace some things that God intended for human compassion and community. Um, I will say, I think random acts of kindness are great. I just think the idea falls far short of the mindset Paul is urging us to. Kindness is great. It's the random that bothers me. <laughs> Something is important. This important it shouldn't be random. And I was working on this sermon. I started thinking, okay, how do I replace the word random in the bumper sticker to try to find the idea that Paul is talking about? And I kept writing ideas down and then crossing them out because they were inadequate. And random went uh, from random to intentional and then to rational and then to planned and then to measured and then to frequent. But you know what I finally settled on was? I think what scripture is urging us toward is kindness that is instinctive. Kindness that is instinctive. A kindness that is not simply random or even planned, but kind acts that just happened instinctively as kindness flows out of our character, just as naturally as water flows out of a stream. You know, we don't think what kind acts I can do today. We simply act with kindness in every opportunity or circumstance we find in ourselves, because God is recreating that in our character as he gives us the fruit of his spirit. And I think that's what Paul means when in Colossians he gives us another list. We've talked about this list before. It says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly beloved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, Christotis, humility, gentleness, and patience. And I love that image. Clothe yourself with kindness. And I think that if we slow down in our busy life and look at the people all around us instead of rushing by them, you'll find plenty of opportunity to show them kindness. Not just regular kindness, but the kindness of God in your day-to-day -day life. Often the people who need the most kindness may be the people who are the roughest on the exterior. Yeah, I came across a video a few years ago. I've never shown it to you before. While it's not about kindness per se, I think it speaks about the mindset we need to have if we are going to make kindness an instinctive part of our character. Uh, maybe as you watch this, video, instead of thinking service, when it says service, think of kindness, and I think you'll see how it fits. Let me, let me show it to you. Oh, I 
kid. Every time I'm pulling out, he's right there. Man. And someone needs to talk to his parents. <laughs> if they're ever at home. Oh, there's... Oh. <laughs> okay, so I'm not even here. Right. <sighs> Great lady. <laughs> the princess of parking. Oh, sure. Take the spot. Way to be considerate. Oh, are you kidding me? Unbelievable. Oh. What can I get for you? Uh, yeah, I'll have a tall decaf macchiato. Yeah, sure, no problem. Two three eighty five. And uh, it might take a few minutes here. We've got quite a line, obviously, and thanks to your patience. Great. Yeah, <laughs> great. Great for me. Waiting again. Unbelievable. What? What is... What is that? What in the world? Oh, uh, uh. what? What am I supposed to do? How can I how can I do anything about that? Can I even help with that? I don't your coffee, sir. Oh. I, I can't I can't take this anymore. I, I gotta get out of here. Hey, watch it. Hey, buddy, come here. I do think one of the key elements in being kind towards others is empathy. Realizing that, that on the inside, many people are hurting and in pain that you can't see on the outside, and that a little kindness and understanding can make a huge difference. Get kindness. Let me finish with two quick points this morning and then one final illustration. First, I'm not suggesting that Christians simply become doormats or allow themselves to be routinely taken advantage of. Ultimately, it is no kindness to someone to allow them to act with malice or disrespect towards anyone else. Some kinds of kindest thing we can do for someone is to help them become a better person. And that's often difficult and painful. Even when we know we need to turn the other cheek, we need to let people know what they're doing is not okay. It hurts when you pour antiseptic on an open wound. But a kind act is sometimes an act that's tough now, but prevents greater pain down the line. I still think it's impossible to be instinctively kind to people and always have it work out the way we hope. You know, in the New Testament, we often read of kindness as God's kindness towards us. Titus 3, 4, and 5. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us not because of the righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. God, faith alone, grace alone, Christ alone, okay? And it is that kindness given with tolerance and patience, that kindness that leads us to realize God's love for us and our need to turn to him. Romans 4.2. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his God's kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads you towards repentance?
kindness has to change us, but even God's kindness is often in order taken advantage by a world that loves the grace, but ignores the way that God's grace must change us. Still, if God is willing to offer kindness to a world that will all too often simply take advantage of God's kindness, can we do any less? Kindness only appears as weakness to those who do not know God's ultimate act of kindness. And we studied this in Ephesians this last year. And God raises us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Jesus. What an incredible act that is. In order that in the coming ages to come, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed to us how? In his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. God's been kind to us. We can be kind to others in ways that hopefully will change them, but not always. Second, let me say that, that it is never kind to simply accept or facilitate someone doing something that God tells us is wrong or facilitate someone when they're doing something that harms themselves or others. You know, there is a lot of human behavior that God tells us is destructive that's now being tolerated or accepted in the name of kindness. We need to be careful to always be as kind as we can to people while at the same time not supporting or condoning behavior God tells us is wrong. Kindness never trumps God's direction for humanity. And that's a difficult line to follow sometimes. You know, I gotta tell you, friends, I never give money to people who stand on street corners and beg. I've been told by people who work with the homeless that much of the money given to them is used to buy booze or cigarettes or drugs. And it's not kindness to help someone do that to themselves. And beyond that, you know, I'm very often simply supporting someone in a flawed and dependent lifestyle does nothing more than keep them trapped in it not kindness to support that. Kindness applied incorrectly or in a vacuum can sometimes do more harm than good. So be careful about how you act in kind ways. Let me finish this morning with a final story that I think addresses the kind of instinctive kindness that God wants us to have. I'm always very careful when I tell stories about myself because I think there are too many pastors who tell such stories to elevate themselves in the eyes of the congregation. You may know that most of the time I tell you a story about me, it, it shows what a fallen human and immature Christian I still am. <laughs> um, you know, God still works with idiots fairly well. Um, but, but the one I want to tell you today shows that God has made at least a little bit of progress in me, at least I hope he has. About 35 years ago, when I was serving in my first call out of seminary, is when this happened, I was making then the astronomical salary of $22,000 a year. Now, that was a lot of money for a guy who'd been living on five or $6,000 a year all the way through, through college and seminary. But one day, I happened to be around noon in a thrift store, and I overheard a conversation between a boy who was maybe 9 or 10 and his mother. He was looking longingly at the bicycles there, and he said to his mom, Mom, do you think I could get a bike someday? And she replied, well, well maybe someday we'll have some money for it. Now, I'm going to tell you, friends, that just broke my heart. I mean, I, I kind of grew up poor, but I always had a bike. And quite frankly, it was my prized possession. You know, my mobility, my freedom. It's frankly, it's one of the reasons I think I still like, love to ride a bike. To think this boy didn't even have a bike was terrible to me. And so I left the store, and I was in my car turning out of the parking lot. I thought to myself, you know, I have $20 in my pocket. And I would never miss it if I didn't have it. And there isn't a bike in that store that's over $20. So I'm going to go back to the store, give the cashier $20, tell her to let that boy have any bike he wants. And I, I just made my, my heart sore to think of that. Now, the problem was that this was in noontime traffic in a divided road in a very busy area that didn't cooperate. I know living in Ellensburg, this sounds impossible, but it actually took me 10 minutes to make two U-turns in two blocks and get back to the store. When I got there, the boy was gone. And I will tell you that it still pains me to this day to not have been able to buy that bike. Not just because he didn't get the bike, but because of my own realization that kindness and generosity at that point were not very instinctive to me. Flash forward about 35 years to the REI store in Issaquah just a couple of years ago. I was in that store while I observed a father and his young boy looking at camping equipment. 
The boy was obviously significantly handicapped. He walked with an arm crutch slowly and awkwardly. His growth and his speech seemed stunted, but he was excited about their upcoming first camping trip. While they were there looking around, they found a folding camping chair that was low to the ground and actually fit him perfectly. And you could see the delight on his face to find something that actually worked for him. But this is REI and they carry expensive stuff and the chair was $100. And as I kind of probably inappropriately listened, I watched the dad help the boy out of the chair and he told him that, that they would need to wait for a while to buy the chair for another trip because they couldn't quite afford it now. And honestly, you could see the disappointment in his face. And in that moment, I saw the boy and the bicycle all over again. And I instantly launched myself at the REI employee who had been helping them. I dragged him over to the checkout counter. I told him I was buying that chair. And as soon as I left the store, he was to take it over and give it to the boy. And frankly, he got a pretty broad smile on his face too. I would have loved to have stayed and watched what happened, but I really didn't want there to be any chance at all the father could refuse the gift. You know, if, if, if the giver was gone and the chair was paid for, what could you do? The best hundred dollars I've ever spent in my life. And look, folks, it take me 35 years to get to that point. That's not worth applause. But, you know, it made, it made me feel like God had made some progress in me. You know, that the act of kindness was, was now more instinctive. Yeah, maybe driven a little bit by guilt in the past, but like all the fruit of the Spirit should be, it's now more seamlessly ingrained in my character. God has, has got a long way to go with me, but he's making some headway. And that would be my hope and my prayer and my challenge for you, that God would be working in your life to make true kindness an instinct in you, something that happens seamlessly and instantly. Friends, clothe yourself with kindness. You will never be better dressed. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the kindness that you have showed us in, in Jesus Christ, that, that you have come to us in, in him. Uh, showed us a kindness that we didn't deserve, saved us when we didn't deserve to be saved, loved us when we didn't deserve to be loved. And Father, if we're going to be like you, if, if the fruit of your spirit is going to change our lives, that's the direction we need to move as well. Help us to be kind, Lord. Help us to be giving. Help it to be an instinct within us whenever we see a need. And we pray that when we are kind, the people will look through us and see the Savior that made it all possible. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, indeed, great is his faithfulness and great is his kindness. Go forward into this world, knowing and trusting both, being kind to everyone you meet. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, his blessings, his mercy, be with you now and forevermore. Amen.